According to our time, it is 2.35, and this is the Friday, June 21st, 2013 session on online teaching here at Long Beach City College. I am T.L. Brink. I am from Crafton Hills College in Yakaipa, California. And some of you are wondering, where is that? Well, there's the map, and it's about halfway between L.A. and Palm Springs. If you are driving on the 10, you will see one sign, Yakaipa Boulevard, Crafton Hills College. You missed that one little sign right after Redlands. You've missed it. We're part of the San Bernardino Community College District, the same community college district that brought you EduStream. This particular session is on how to use Google Documents for student collaboration. How many of you have used Google Documents? Over half of you. That's great. How many of you have used Google Documents with your students' term projects? Just a few of you. And hopefully you two that have used it will also share and tell me how you use it. I am not a high technology person, unlike some of my illustrious colleagues at the San Bernardino Community College District. I am primarily interested in the teaching end of it, what we used to call pedagogy and what some of my colleagues call andragogy, the science of adult learning. Now, some of my other presentations that you can find online on page 18 of your programs, I have one on how to use student videos. And on page 19, I have one about an online free open source statistical package called Spatcato. But today, we're going to focus on how to use Google Documents for student collaboration. Now, if you've got your smartphones, just take a picture of that, and you'll have access to my site. And if you don't have a smartphone, capable of getting that quick response code. You can do it the old-fashioned way. Uh, there is my website that will give you the documents that we're talking about today. Or you can do it the 1990s way of actually sending me an email. And I'm going to give you several of my email addresses. I have... Uh, one at the San Bernardino Community College District, but I also have one of the easiest email addresses around. My last name, B-R-I-N-K, at USA.com. Now, of course, I also live in Mexico, so you can also reach me at brink at Mexico.com. So you've got many different ways to reach me, and I just want you to go ahead and make that contact if you cannot get to this particular site. Any questions while we're waiting for everybody to snap the picture and, and get the QR code? Well, whatever. I, I don't know whatever you do to make it work. Okay. Let's go on. There's the, uh, the site itself. I have it on the board. What I'm going to say is there are many technological innovations that are the solution. The computer itself, when it was created, was the solution. I remember my first encounter with a computer in 1967 at Claremont Men's College in my calculus class, and they showed us a computer, and they showed us how to program it with these IBM cards that uh, would load it in, in Fortran. And uh, my question afterwards is, isn't it just easier to calculate it by hand? 
So the computer was the solution. I wasn't sure what the problem was. So Google Docs are the solution. But can they fit a problem or problems that we educators have when it comes to having our students write projects? I say that they are. Let's take a look at the problems we face with getting our students to do their projects for our class. First of all, students don't cover the right things in their papers. I'm sure many of you have had the situation where you assign a term project, and you know exactly what you want it to look like, and you get back one long paragraph, seven pages long. And it doesn't really cover the points that you wanted them to cover. And Google Documents can help enforce the right outline on them. Another thing I'm sure many of you have heard from your students is, can I please see an example of, of what it should look like? Can I see an example of one that is done correctly? So we can provide that to them with Google Documents. Another frustration that I have had is sometimes when I do see an excellent student project, I say, why couldn't I share this with all of the students? And perhaps many of you in the past have tried oral presentations where students get to the front of the room and, and read their presentations. Well, nowadays we don't always have the logistics, even in on-campus courses, to schedule something like that. In an online course, of course, uh, they're not meeting in the same physical room. But it is a problem that they cannot always see their own best work, just their off-the-cuff discussion in the discussion forum. And wouldn't it be great if they also had the opportunity to correct each other's projects? What I have noticed is students write better if they have a chance to actually take the role that I take as someone who makes corrections on projects. And one of the things that frustrated me when I was a student many years ago, I would write a paper, thinking usually it was a very good paper, get it back from the professor, and I actually got a few Bs in my major, and that was always very frustrating because I was convinced that this is a great paper. And then I would get it back and it would have a B on it, and the professor would say, well, that's not what I was looking for. I was looking for this, that, and the other thing. Why didn't you say so? And so I resolved that if I ever became a professor, I would be crystal clear as to my expectations in terms of what I wanted. Another thing I noticed is that when most students get their papers back, if the professor has gone to the trouble to make a list of wonderful comments, I've seen students. Oh, B. They don't even bother to read the comments that we professors have so painstakingly made, because it's too late now. Those comments really won't help. Wouldn't it be great if the student had a chance, a second chance, to create that perfect paper and to sort of deal with all those corrections? So those are the problems, and Google Documents is the solution. So here's the way I do it, and you may want to do it a little bit differently. But the first thing I do is I create a skeleton of a good project. And each student then starts out with a site or a document that is that student's project. And that student edits that skeleton. Now, in that skeleton, there are three different colors. There's black, and that black includes the outline that I want that student to follow. And here's the rule. The student cannot erase anything that's in black. So I'll have a thing that says name, and I'll actually type the student's name there. Section, and I'll type the student's section there. And then each section of the project, exactly where I want it, will be there. If there's a certain key phrase I want, boom, that key phrase will be there in black, which means the student must have that phrase there. 
then I have instructions in red telling the student, this is what I want you to do in this section. This is what I want you to do in this section. Don't do this in this section. Do it in the other section. So the student knows exactly what I am saying. Finally, I give an example of a good project. And I do that in blue. So the student can see what a good project looks like. Step two, the student edits the skeleton project. The student types in black. And as the student goes through each section, the student may erase the red instructions and may erase the blue example. But the student cannot erase the black outline. The student adds to it but doesn't erase it. Now, the student's first draft in black is due November the 30th for the fall semester. For the spring semester, that's April the 30th. Now, we are on 18-week semesters. We start mid-August for our fall semester. We go to mid-December. Spring semester, we start mid-January and go through the end of May. So in saying that the deadline is November the 30th or April the 30th, I'm creating a deadline about three weeks before the end of the semester. At this point, the other students have an opportunity during the first week of December or the first week of May to make corrections on those projects. And what I have done is I've figured out what I'm going to give credit for and what I'm not going to give credit for. What I don't give credit for, commas, mostly because I'm not an English teacher and I've never really been able to figure out exactly when is a comma necessary and when is a comma not necessary. Uh, I don't give corrections for spacing. Otherwise, somebody will say, oh, you're supposed to use two spaces after a pyramid. Somebody else will say, no, 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 give one space after a pyramid. I don't want to get into those debates. So you can decide what kind of corrections you really want to give credit for and what kind you just don't want to argue about. Now, some students have criticized me because uh, I do care about spelling, grammar punctuation, and proper terminology. I even give the students a list of terms that you should be careful with in my classes. Now, I'm a professor of psychology, and so when students are taking a psychology class from me, I don't want them to use the word hysteria or hysterical to refer to anxiety. It, it has a different connotation within psychology. And so if a student points out an error and suggests a correction in another student's project, I will give credit for that. But I'm reserving my major credit for when students give a deeper analysis. When some student says, well, I think you could expand your section on Freud and also mention Freud's theory of the Electra complex, because those are the kind of deepening that will benefit everyone. So that's step three. All students get to see all projects and comment on them during the first week of December or the first week of May. And I have the other students comment right on the documents in green. Now, there's other ways to do it. There's actually a little comment function if you're afraid that somebody might start messing up the, the original document. I have not had that 
uh, be a problem now in several years of using Google Documents. Step four, I grade each student's project and I grade all students' comments on each other's projects. Give yourself about 36 hours and give yourself a lot of coffee or whatever you used to stay away. <laughs> that is a major, major task. And yes, you will find yourself erasing some of the comments that uh, aren't right. Uh, you'll have some students say, uh, you talked about Freud's id. That should be a capital I period, capital D period. No, that's not right. And I have in, some students say, um, oh, you said that the patient had a myocardial infarction. That should be myocardial infraction. No, it's myocardial infarction. So you realize that some students will uh, assume that they know more than they do and make bad comments, and you have to correct those. And of course, I will make additional comments in red saying, yes, do expand this part here about Freud's theory and tie in a little bit more Maslow. Step five, each student may revise his or her own project, taking account of the comments that I have made and the other students have made. And then the last day of the semester, the revisions are due. Now, some students will get such a high grade that they may say, I'm going to stand pat on the score that I have already. I don't need to make a revision. Students are always happy to get a high score on their, uh, their initial job. Now, what are the advantages of using this solution? I contend that the quality of writing derived is much higher. Now, are any of you professors of psychology? OK. Uh, have you been to uh, the Western Psychological Association convention the last three years? OK. Have you wandered along the poster session? Have you seen? Craft and Hills College posters. Well, we had more poster presentations than any other community college in the 2011 conference in LA, more presentations than any other community college in the 2012. In 2013, uh, we were down a little bit. So we only had like eight presentations. But um, we have been very successful in, in doing student presentations that were good enough to be accepted. Our acceptance ratio is very high. We're getting about 80 to 90 percent acceptance ratio at conferences like that. We've also been to Society for the Scientific Study of Religion. I have uh, one student doing a presentation at the American Sociological Association this summer in New York. Uh, we also present at the um, Honors Transfer Council of California in Irvine in March, Southern California Conference of uh, Undergraduate Research. Next year, we're also going to be sending some students to the APS if they get their uh, uh, presentations accepted. So the quality of writing that, that emerges is actually uh, uh, quite high. And the other thing is a sharing of knowledge and experiences. And I think that's really important, especially in an online type environment. There's one big disadvantage. It is more work for the professor, not less. You're correcting the corrections. You're correcting the recorrected paper. Yeah, there's more work there. So unless you really love doing this stuff, which I do, it's, it's not a time saver. And a lot of people get into online for the wrong reason. Those of you who have taught online know it's more work. This is a labor-intensive endeavor. OK, so once again, if you didn't snap it before, this is the time to snap it. And uh, I will give you some uh, examples now 
of uh, that are actually on my site. So let's go on to my site. That's what you're going to see when you go there. Interestingly enough, there are some other things that you can catch on my site. You can, there's a contact level. Uh, if you are interested in the geriatric depression scale, you can get a uh, free online copy. There are also links to sites where you can actually administer uh, the scale. Some of the presentations that my students had at the Society for the Scientific Study of Religion, a presentation that I made uh, a couple of weeks ago in Mexico City at an anthropological conference about the writings of Oscar Lewis, uh, a neat little vocational assessment package, all free and available for you to use. But what you see here are several documents that I use as skeletons for the different kinds of projects that I have. So just let me show these to you. Because, and by the way, you can download these and you can modify them however you want. You can use these as a skeleton and develop your own approach. So let's take a look. One kind of project I give is a book review project, not a book report, a book review. And this is what the student's Google document looks like. The student has to choose a book approved by me. And notice we have the red instructions. And I might have two sections here, one that starts in January, one that starts in February. And I will erase the other one. So let's suppose that this is a student who starts in January. So that's the site Jan uh, session. And by the way, you can have people in other sections look at each other's paper. I have some of my advanced students in the uh, 111 lifespan class look at the intro students as well and give comments. You could also invite people from outside of the, the classroom to come look and comment. One of the things I did when we first got into online, before we had Blackboard or anything like this, this was in the late 90s, is I was the editor of a professional journal at the time. So I had some interesting contacts. And uh, online uh, discussion was still pretty new. So I had a course in abnormal psychology. What I did is I was able to get a social worker from one of the VA hospitals, a psychiatrist at the uh, New York uh, Psychiatric Institute, even a psychoanalyst from Caracas, Venezuela, to participate with my students in, in their discussion. So I never know what these people would say, and they would come online and they would present things from, uh, from different points of view. And this is something else you can do with Google Documents. You can invite anybody in the world to come on and participate well with your students and make uh, comments. So. Here we go. Uh, the first thing I want them to do is get complete bibliographical information about the book. If you don't tell them that, they might forget to put something important. So I give them an example. It just happens to be a book that, that I'm the author of. But uh, it gives them an example. So they can go in there and they'll erase uh, my name as author and they'll put in the author of uh, the book that they have, the title, and so forth. And then I want them to give a very brief description, a couple of paragraphs, that's all, telling you what is the book about. And if you don't say that, you tell them it's a book review, many students will simply say, the book said this, the book said that, I liked it and you will too. And that's not the kind of critical thinking we want. So I just have a very, very brief review of what the book is. And then I tell them, OK, you're going to review that book from five different psychological perspectives. What would a behaviorist say about the book? In other words, pretend you're B.F. Skinner or John Watson and criticize the book from those perspectives. Then pretend that you're Sigmund Freud and criticize the book from a psychoanalytic perspective. Then Take a cognitive perspective and criticize the book. Then take a humanistic perspective. Pretend that you're Carl Rogers or uh, Abraham Maslow 
and finally take a social psychology perspective like Simbardo or Milgram and criticize the book. So that's what the uh, book review project would look like. That's the structure I want them to follow. And Google Documents I enforce that structure. Now here we see a kind of a case study, a project that I use for my uh, 111 lifespan development class, a class that's very popular because it's required for most nursing programs. And so most of the students I have here are pre-nursing. And one of the things uh, I have them do, one option for a project, is a case study of a historical person, someone that they can read about by reading several biographies. And it should be someone that they're already pretty familiar with and really interested in. So they have to pick this historical subject and then write about the person. My purpose is to get them to demonstrate the application of some lifespan developmental theory, principally Eric Erickson's eight stages. So my example in blue is Joseph Smith, Jr., the founder and prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is the Mormon prophet, certainly a fascinating type figure. So once again, I state his life in just a paragraph or so. And then I tell the students, you tell more about this person's life in the individual stages. And so what I have them do is an analysis of basic temperament. I show them how to use a personality assessment scale where they are uh, going to assess the person on a 48 adjective checklist. And this is going to give a personality analysis. And the one that I want them to use is uh, a Holland code, which is vocationally related. If you prefer Myers-Briggs or uh, some other technique, you can use that. So this way, the student is forced to use this particular uh, personality assessment tool and then write about the uh, subject's uh, personality. Then the student has to go through Erickson's eight stages. And there's a few other things I have the student do. Uh, do an analysis of uh, role theory and do an analysis of uh, decision making. And then student has to do an annotated bibliography where the student not only gets complete bibliographical information, but tells me in a few sentences what he or she got out of that particular source. Was it objective? And uh, where were the limitations of that source? So this is a way to, to demonstrate how to do that and to force the student to do those things. Another option that students in that class have is to do a project of a live person. Now, of course, there is no bibliography or biography written about a live person. The student then has to do a long interview. And I give the student the structure for that interview. And it usually lasts around 90 minutes with an older person, like someone you might find in a senior center or a nursing home. And then, the uh, once again, we see uh, how the structure is. A very brief paragraph about the person's life, basic temperament assessed with this personality uh, program. Another kind of project that I'll have my students do, I also teach a class in world religions. And one of the kinds of projects they may do in that class is a case study of a particular denomination. And so I show them exactly what I want them to do in there. I make them go out and do an actual interview of a leader in that particular denomination. And there are 12 questions that must be asked. They also have to do a search on the internet. And they actually have to go to the library and do some, some research there, as they do in, in all of my projects. 
right now I want to point out my librarian who is embedded in my classes. This is Catherine Hendrickson from Crafton Hills College, and I hand the students over to her uh, to help them get through the library and the web. And what were you going to say? And change blue to black, yeah. 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 Well, I even tell them, you know, if it totally fits your guy, go ahead, change it from blue to black. But uh, that shows me that they're not thinking very much because uh, if you find you find three consecutive words in here that relate to some other religion. Now, this is describing early Mormonism. Now, how many of these words and phrases are actually going to apply to any other church? So, they're, they're very peculiar. And if you look at my, my questions, how did your denomination get started? And I tell them, you know, in your particular denomination that you study, it's probably certain sections aren't going to be as long. Certain sections might be... Uh, longer. Now this section on Mormonism, they have a very interesting history and so that takes a little bit longer. So I give them the 12 questions that they have to address. Yeah? I can see where this might be more individualized, but in the book review I read through, I was reading your example and that was the thought I had, which is what's going to keep my students from simply Okay. And, you know, I don't think it's been that, that much of a problem. But you look at what I've said and you change it around to whatever matches your technique. That's the beautiful thing about living in the word processing era. Nothing is cast in stone anymore. And if it doesn't, I mean, every semester I tweak this and make it better. As technology changes, as my experience interacting with the students changes, I tweak it every semester. Okay. All right. <laughs> We can. Let me look at a, at a couple of others, and then we'll actually try to upload one and, uh, and see it work. This is called the policy analysis. I've taught a course on critical thinking, and we learn logic and how we make decisions as organizations and as a country. And so they choose a particular topic. And this is very similar to a topic in a formal debate that might exist at a high school or a college level. Like resolve that the probationary period for public school teachers should be extended. This was ballot proposition 74 about uh, six years ago. And you look at uh, need arguments for this. They have to tie in an Aristotelian causal analysis, uh, an epidemiological causal analysis. They have to look at solutions short of the resolution, like minor modifications of the status quo, a counter plan, problems with the workability of the resolution, disadvantages of the resolution, and once again, come up with an annotated bibliography. It really forces them to tie in the course content. Now, this one is a service learning project that I give in my psychology or uh, the um, lifespan development classes. The students do so many hours of volunteer work in a field that they might be interested in. It might be helping out in a soup kitchen or an animal shelter, but most of them are interested in the medical field 
And so they want to do hospital work or nursing home work or child care work. And so once again, if you just let them come up with their own format, they'll say, I did this, I did that, I enjoyed it. And you've got to go deeper than that. You've got to get them to tie in course content. So they've got to tell me about the institutional setting, the education, uh, functions, selection of paid staff and volunteers. Describe your own duties, role, and experiences. Describe the client population and presenting problems. Here I give them an opportunity to, to give a few little case studies and tie in something of uh, what we've been learning about in the psychology classes. Here they can tie in things about uh, consumer behavior psychology or organization theory. And then for the last part, reflecting on this experience, do you see yourself working in a profession related to this field? If not, why not? If so, how would you accomplish that? And here I want them to do a uh, self-assessment using vocational um, psychology like the Holland Code and figure out are they really cut out to work in this particular field. And most students will say, yes, this was a great experience. This is exactly what I want to do. I had one student uh, last semester who told me day one she wanted to be an occupational therapist. And so I said, oh, what would be a good internship for you? And by the way, you don't have to find internships for them. They will find those on their own. And she said, well, the Arrowhead Regional Medical Center has a hand rehabilitation therapy program. That would be really good. And so I said, well, why don't you try this, try that. Maybe I make a few phone calls in between, sort of um, grease the skid, so to speak, so the student can have entree. And anyway, she was... Uh, Working as a volunteer there, she got to learn uh, which profession was concerned with this aspect of treatment, where the nurses work, the social workers, the physical therapist, the occupational therapist. She got to learn the names of the equipment. And essentially, she got to build a network in the field so that when she goes over to Loma Linda University to study, now she's already got some idea of how she's going to function in the field later on. And she was able to tie in terminology of the basic psychology course to what she saw do that. So of all the kinds of projects we've talked about so far, I think the service learning projects really uh, are ideal for Google Documents. And when the students read each other's experiences, they say, wow, I think I want to do that. And, yes. I put out those, those links for everybody and I say go ahead and uh, click on the links that are most interest to you. Yes, I say if you want to get credit for your corrections of other students' projects, you have to make corrections on at least 10 other projects from other students. And you simply can't make the same point over and over again. Otherwise, you're going to have students doing the simple copy and paste. And you're going to see the same comment over and over again. So I, now, let me say that I do something else that I'm going to share with you that you don't have to include with this. And you can do without using Google Documents. But it's something that I've developed and I use it primarily with my online students, but I've also used it with, with other students in on-ground classes. And it's called multiple options grading. And I'll say, you want to take the final exam, I'll count it up to 50% of your grade. You want to do this project, I'll count it up to 50% of your grade. You want to do the, uh, the discussion on Blackboard, okay, I'll count that up to 50% of your grade. 50, 50, 50, 150. 
something's not adding up. I'll tell you what's not adding up. What I tell the students is, in other words, if you don't want to do a project, okay, you don't have to do it. But you've got to do a lot of discussion. You've got to write some essays. You've got to analyze other people's projects. You've got to take the final exam. You don't want to take the final exam? You don't have to take the final exam. But you've got to do the project. You've got to do a lot of discussions. You don't want to do the daily discussion? You don't have to. But you've got to do a project and you've got to do the final exam. So I give them these options. And online students love options. Some don't like big projects. Some don't want to have to get on every day and participate with the discussion. They want one big project to do and one big final at the end. And I'm Mr. Flexible. I have high standards, but I'm flexible as to how the students can meet those standards. So not everybody's doing a project. The majority of students do. Not all the students comment on everybody else's project. The majority do. So that's my multiple option system. I like it because it plays to the students' strengths and interests. It doesn't require everybody to do everything, including the things that they have the least amount of interest in or ability for. Now last, let's take a look at my skeleton for surveys and experiments. Now, most of those presentations that we're doing at Western Psych Association are in the realm of surveys and experiments. And the biggest problem if you've ever tried to get students to do empirical research is they think that when they've distributed the survey, they're done. And of course, that's only that much of the total amount of work. So I help them tabulate their data, use the Scott Cotto program to come up with correlation coefficients and statistical significance. And then I send them to Katherine Hendrickson for uh, doing library research on whatever uh, uh, things we're going to focus on. But the important thing is, uh, following the right structure and writing things up, having a clear abstract, a good introduction, a clear statement of hypotheses. And the hard part for most students is to do the method section, knowing what to put in the uh, participants and sampling, the apparatus, operational definitions, procedure data analysis, how to structure the results in terms of tables, going through the individual hypotheses, and then focusing on the discussion. So it's these kinds of uh, structure that have given our students the success they need uh, in this particular area. OK. Yeah, the students really like it. It's just a matter of being the, I call the guardian angel, to help that online student, or even the on-campus student, um, embrace the technology and not being intimidated by it. The more people you have on your campus who will hold the hand of the student and say, oh, here's how you do it. And although I'm teaching mostly online, I have office hours. I'm very proud to say that for the last two years, the students of Crafton Hills College voted me the most accessible professor. That's because, very true, because it was on a Friday night. And on Friday night, I try to be the most accessible grandpa. <laughs> Which is what I'm going to be doing tonight. Yeah, I'm babysitting. Okay. But the point is that I maintain those office hours. And sometimes I'm there in the morning, sometimes in the afternoon, sometimes I'm there in the evening. I'll actually email out my uh, office hours each week and say, here's where I'm going to be. And I, I say the majority of my on 
line students will come in to see me. And they're on camp by the way, most of your online students will be on your campus of taking other classes that they can't get online. The major reason students have for taking online classes is the convenience of time shifting, not just physical distance. And so they are on campus. If you're in your office, they will come in. A lot of my classes are late start, and I will start sending out emails at the beginning of the semester and say, come in and see me if you have any problems logging online, figuring out how to work the Blackboard discussion. I will show you hands-on, one-on-one, on my computer, and it really does make a difference. So those are my examples. Now, let's see if I can make Google Documents work. I'm going to take something and uh, I'm going to get into Google Documents. I'm going to load a file and start editing. Okay. So let's close this out. And let's see. Let me go into Google Documents. Docs.google.com. Okay. I'm in the Google Documents. Those, what you see right now, are the projects of my students that were turned in on May 24th. That was the deadline. So notice how many were turned in right on May 24th. And then you may see some that were uh, edited by me, and maybe the, the, the student never really uh, corrected. See, there are some of my comments still there. She did not even erase some of the things, so this one was really not not complete on time. I didn't credit that as completed. But let's suppose I wanted now to um, create a new one. Okay, I'm going to create a new document. And I can simply paste it right in there. So I could take any of the things that you've seen so far as simple as, as copy and paste. There's another way to do it, which is to upload a file and then edit it. So this is an example of a Google Documents file. Okay. And you could simply do it uh, like that. Now, if I try to upload, notice how it immediately saves it. I didn't even have to get on the save function. So let's suppose I want to change uh, the name here. Uh, rename. Student Jones Project. Okay. That's Student Jones Project. Now, So far, I'm the only one who can do it. It's a private document for me. Let's see what I can do. I'm going to click on Share. So far, only the people listed below have access, me. I'm going to click on Change. I can make it public on the web. I can 
make it visible to anyone with the link. I'm going to choose that. Now, so far, anyone can view it. I'm going to change, I can change that to anyone can comment, and I can go up here to anyone can edit. Okay, I'm going to save that. So here's the exact link of that. I'm going to copy that. And I can then get into my email. I can paste the link and send it to a particular student. What I do is I usually build an Excel file where I will have the student name in one column, the title of the project in a different column, and then this link in another column. And I'll tell the students, OK, go to this particular page and click on the links of those projects that look to be of interest to you. What I like about Google is it is very user friendly. You don't have to train your students in how to do Google Documents. It's the sort of thing like Facebook or how to text on a cell phone that they can figure out for themselves. No, that's the other beautiful thing. You do not need a Google account unless you arrange it so that they must sign in. Then they would need a Google account. Now, that's the, the, the upside of that. It's, it's accessible, universal, the way I have it up here. The downside of that is I really don't know who's making the comment. And so I have to tell them, when you're typing your comments in green, if you want to get credit for them, you put your name and your section. You put um, Tom Smith in the Psych Jam class. So when I see the green comment, I'll know to give Tom Smith credit for that. Yes. Yes. Well, no. I, I go back on the uh, after the deadline for their corrections has passed. I go back. I click on the document, and I will see the the green there. Let me go back and see if I've got some examples here of people who. Uh, this account saves automatically. Let me see if this example. OK, I'm going to take a look at this one student's work here. OK, this is one of my students who did a service learning project at the Lake Arrowhead Repertory Theater. And yeah. And notice that here you have another student, Jesse Stewart, criticizing his use of some smack dab. Is that what you want in your car? Is that what I call you? Right? And so sometimes the students will be quite critical uh, of each other. And so, and here's Natalie Gertz, and she has her own uh, suggestions. And here's Felipe Uribe saying, you know, you mentioned that here's a liquor store, clarify what that means. And Lauren Oakes says, what is an employee? You mean an employee? <laughs> oh, hey, well, I, I, I set the tone. I set the tone that I don't put up with, you know, bad English or improper writing. So to a certain extent, they're, they're reflecting me. I'm not gentle. And, you know, there's a spelling error. So you see all kinds of, uh, of things. Now, it turns out I think he got an A in the class without particularly uh, revising this particular uh, paper. He did well in his exam, did well in his discussion. So he did not uh, feel the need to, uh, to come back and do this. And the red is me, like issues. He's got issues. No, no, let's find a better term, see the writing rules. So that this gives you an idea of even a relatively good student, uh, how the other students uh, will respond. Now, this is, is really uh, forcing them to write at a, at a higher level than, than they have written before. 
And as I tell them on, on day one of the class, you know, that I'm going to be brutal with them, I kid you not, in one of my on-campus classes last semester, the very first day of class, you know, I asked a student a question, and he responded, and I corrected his grammar. He actually got up and left and quit the class because he didn't want somebody correcting his grammar. And, you know, that's the tone I set. If, if you don't want to set that tone, you know, you don't have to. But that's my style in an on-campus class or uh, in an online class. You know, I do have high standards and I expect the students to, to live up to them. Yes? Uh, good question. Now, As far as I know, there is nothing that would prevent an anonymous student from erasing or tampering with the black test. I tell them, I'll know if you did that. <laughs> Actually, I don't. Now, how could I protect that? Let me give you two ways. Number one, when you saw me decide to make this public, I had three options, private only for me, Anyone with the link could edit, which is what I selected. Or there was a third option, which you may choose. That third option is anyone with the link may comment, in which case you will see comments on one side, and nobody but the, the author or me would have the ability to actually go in and, and make changes in, in the text. Now, there is something else that you can utilize. It's not that convenient. I've only rarely used it. And that is, you can go back and look at previous edits. So it saves a record of previous edits. So you want to go back to two days before this and see what it was like? You can do that. So that's one of the, um, the great benefits here with Google Documents. You can see uh, previous savings of the documents. Now, by the way, one thing that you haven't seen me do throughout my review of this document, and I have made some changes. I've added some spaces and so forth, and I can, I can erase things. Notice that little thing up on top. Probably most of you didn't see it right up here, right? A second or two after I made the change that said saving, it saves automatically. You don't have to click save. You don't have to look at the save button. No, no, it saves automatically. Yes. Yes. Well, let me, once again, let's go through the steps. I create a document for each student. I email each student his or her particular link. So until April the 30th or this, uh, November the 30th, each student only knows about his own particular link and is working on that particular link. It's not the, the link is directly to their document. Now, on the 1st of December or the 1st of May, I say, oh, look at this spreadsheet. And I want you to correct at least 10 other documents. Click on whichever 10 will interest you. Just for good measure, do at least 12 in case some of your comments aren't that good. I'll count your best 10. And so, no, I don't have to give them a password to get into my Google Documents site. I just give them the link to that particular document. So remember, I'm, I've got documents that differ as to format. I've got the service learning projects. I've got the uh, surveys. And I've got some that deal with religious studies and some that deal with lifespan development. So I can decide for any particular class which documents I'm going to make available to them. So people in the world religion class are not going to get any document about a survey related to um, oh, child abuse as it is perceived in two different cultures. 
but they may get a, um, a link to a survey that some psychology student did where religiosity or is being compared to um, uh, prejudice against uh, Muslims or something like that. And so this way I can have students look at other projects that other classes are doing that may be of interest to them. So you've got a great deal of flexibility here. Now, now this is the way that I do it. But you don't have to do it my way. You set up your own rules. Now there's a trend in online education that I have ambivalence toward. And some major universities, like during one of the breaks I was talking with Grand Canyon University, and I know University of Phoenix does it, I know Post University does it, where a content expert writes or develops the course and somebody else is hired to teach the course and you're just facilitating the content. Versus in the community colleges, what works in most cases is you are the expert, you have the academic freedom, to figure out how to meet the course objectives as stated in the course outline of record. Well, I am a firm believer in academic freedom. So this is just a tool. How you use it in your classes depends upon your style of teaching, the kinds of students you have, and the kind of content that you have to embrace in your own particular discipline. This has worked well for me in psychology. If you're in music, if you're in dance, if you're in PE, if you're in speech, if you're in art appreciation, maybe you need something different, a different use of Google Documents or some other kind of, of technology. Never let the technology limit your innovation. Always let the technology facilitate your innovation. The technology systems that exist are like a buffet. You don't have to eat everything that you see in front of you. Nibble here and there and then choose to feast on that which nourishes you and your students. I think our time is up. My pleasure.